welcome to this uh, important seminar. And I'm sure by now everybody knows why we're here for the discussion of the first detection of gravitational waves at GW 150914. I'm sure it's all emblazoned in your memory. <laughs> and uh, we're very fortunate to have two uh, speakers who played a key role in the uh, detection. And uh, before I introduce them, just let me say that in my email, I very foolishly said, and come to the seminar, hyphen, there will be champagne. <laughs> <laughs> and then some smart ass emailed me and said, you do realise that champagne means French from the district, not that crap sparkling wine that you get in Australia. So I hope there'll be champagne. Well, there's good news and bad news. I went out today with my own funds, not school funds, I bought a bottle of champagne. And this is going to go to Eric and Yuri and, and, uh, and Duncan and Paul and Letizia uh, and uh, those that are actually involved in the LSC, the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. The rest of you are going to get sparkling wine. <laughs> will be served in uh, tastefully uh, sculpted plas plastic flutes by uh, Gene afterwards. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, Eric and uh, Yuri. I'll hand you across to uh, Yuri. So it is my pleasure today to start a discussion about the LIGO experiment. LIGO is a project which is very dear to my heart. I spent uh, my PhD years working on this and I have, uh, after finishing my PhD, I switched into more mainstream astrophysics, but uh, now LIGO is becoming mainstream astrophysics, so it's a particularly special time to talk to you about this. Um, so uh, this is on the front uh, picture, the first slide is uh, one, of the LIGO, one of the two LIGO sites uh, at Hanford in the state of Washington, United States. You see this beautiful desert and uh, an arm which outstretches four kilometers arm. There is an arm which goes in perpendicular direction also four kilometers. So it's an L-shaped site. Let me just show you what the other site looks like. This is uh, the site which is built in swamps in Louisiana, again in the United States. And the outline of my talk uh, is like this. So first of our talk, I should say, is like this. So first, um, I'll talk a little bit about general relativity, about black holes. Then I'll um, switch into the design and sensitivity of advanced LIGO. So talk to you a little bit about the physics of interferometer and then hand it completely over to Eric, who will uh, discuss the recent discovery of the event GW150914. So, first of all, a little bit about GR. GR was the finishing touches of GR were put by Albert Einstein in 1915, uh, and uh, essentially all of the theories encompassed in this beautiful equation. On the left hand side, you have the Einstein tensor G alpha beta, which represents the curvature of space, tells you the geometry of space. And on the right hand side, you have 8 pi T alpha beta. T is the stress energy tensor of matter. So this theory connects geometry of space with the stress energy tensor exerted by matter. Now, for the rest of the talk, I will have no matter. So I'm going to be talking about uh, black holes and gravitational waves and both of them are phenomena which do not require any matter. This is a vacuum phenomenon. Now, for making a black hole and for creating gravitational waves, typically you need matter. Not necessarily, but typically, in, practically in the universe, both of these things are made using matter. But once they are created, they are vacuum solutions and they live on their own. And in fact, they're very, very closely related. Um, so, uh, first, a little bit about black holes. Black holes are the simplest objects in the universe. 
All of the black holes in the universe are described by a Curie metric. And a Curie metric is described by two numbers, the mass of the black hole and its spin. And the structure of the black hole, of course, it took lots of clever people to understand it. But in fact, it is very simple. So a spinning black hole, a curved black hole, consists of um, three regions. The first region is outside of the black hole, outside of the ergosphere. Then there is an ergosphere. An ergosphere is the region of the black hole from which you can still escape if you try really hard. But what you cannot do is you cannot rotate in the sense which is opposite of the black hole. So your light cones are pointing in the same way that the black hole is rotating. An ergosphere is the region of the black hole where it interacts most strongly with the outside world. So if the spinning black hole can do work on the outside world using the ergosphere and all this wonderful phenomenon that we know in astrophysics where you launch jets which beautifully light up, light up the radio sky and the X-ray sky. This is all happening because of the ergosphere, ergosphere application of black hole to the outside world. Now, the third region is inside the horizon. And inside the horizon, from inside the horizon, you cannot escape. So it's causally disconnected from the outside of the horizon. So it's a very simple structure, uh, which is by now exceedingly well understood. Um, but, uh, um, so, but like I said, black hole is the simplest object in the universe. If you think about it, what is the simplest dynamical process in the universe? The simplest dynamical process in the universe is a merger of two black holes. So let me show you a simulation which is now being done where you have two black holes orbiting each other and dancing around each other and approaching each other because these black holes are emitting gravitational waves. We'll talk about gravitational waves in a second. At the bottom, you see the waveform, the gravitational waveform which comes out. And this is a characteristic chirp signal that has recently been detected, as Eric will describe to you, by LIGO interferometers. But before that, it was simulated by very clever relativists. And so these black holes find each other. The horizons will touch. See, this is the movie which is being artificially slowed down. This is the touch of the horizons. The movie is frozen, just for you to have a look. And you have formation of a new black hole. And this black hole is initially very much perturbed by then, but then these perturbations are very quickly radiated away as ripples of space-time. These are gravitational waves. And it settles down to a new Kerr solution thus enforcing the no hair theorem. The no hair theorem says that you only need two numbers to describe any stationary black hole. So that black hole settles down to a stationary solution by emission of gravitational waves. So gravitational waves enable for the no hair theorem to be observed in such space time. Now, what are these gravitational waves? So this is uh, what gravitational waves are propagating tidal stresses in space. And um, you can see what these tidal stresses do to rings of particles. They come in two polarizations. So the first polarization is shown by plus uh, at the top. And then there is a closed polarization. So it's equivalent to two linear polarizations of electromagnetic waves. And I'm getting dizzy with this picture. So let me remove this. Now, it took several generations of relativists to learn how to simulate mergers of two black holes on the computer. And the success came relatively recently. In 2005, the first simulation was done by Franz Pretorius. It's a single author paper, which was published at Caltech. Franz Pretorius did the first simulation after 30 years or more of work successful simulation. So it's a very difficult problem. But to estimate the amount of relative strain caused by gravitational waves, this dimensionless strain, is actually very easy. 
if you have two black holes of similar sizes merging, you have two numbers in your problem. You have the size of the black hole and you have the distance from the observer to the merger. And this dimensionless strain parameter is just the ratio of the size of the black hole to the distance from the observer to the merger, to the event. So whenever somebody tells you, we have seen, you know, a merger of two tensile mass black holes in Andromeda galaxy, what is the strain of this event? You can immediately calculate it in your head. Now, most of the uh, black holes, and the black holes we're talking about today are stellar mass black holes. So these are black holes which weigh several times the mass of the sun. So they're made by stars. And before current observations by LIGO, the only way we could see stellar mass black holes was if they had an accretion disk around them fed by the companion. So the cartoon of this is shown on this picture where you have uh, a black hole which is tightly distorting the normal stellar companion and pulling off that stream. See that stream which is coming off, feeding the accretion disk, producing wonderful fireworks and x-rays and then driving jets so which light up the sky and radio waves and optical and ultraviolet. It's a whole lot. Now, if you watch the companion, from the recoil of the companion, you can measure the mass of the black hole. So, these black holes have measured masses, and it is important that typical measured masses of these black holes are around 10 solar masses. As you will see later on, the black hole masses which are measured by LIGO are higher, substantially higher. So we don't see such black holes in these systems. This must be, they must have some different formation mechanism for those. Now, if you estimate the numbers, of expected strain from this type of black holes. So for 30 solar mass black hole, they have radius of about 90 kilometers. And if you place the merger at realistic, astrophysically realistic distance, which is a billion light years, okay, to have a chance to observe, you know, several mergers per year or so, you divide 90 kilometers by a billion light years and you get strains of 10 to the minus 20 this is dimensionless number, so no units. Okay, 10 to the minus 20. Now, if you want to express it in terms of the displacement of mirrors, you have to multiply the strain by the length of the arm, by the distance between the two mirrors. So, if you have several kilometers, you do multiplication, you get numbers like 10 to the minus 17 meters that you have to be able to measure for a pair of black holes, which weigh 30 solar masses. If you want to do neutron stars, you have to go an order of magnitude lower, 10 to the minus 18 meters, okay? The radius of a proton, the size of the proton is a Fermi, 10 to the minus 15 meters. So you have to have sensitivities of one thousandth of the radius of a proton, okay? And if this sounds impossible, <laughs> we just proved you wrong. But, <laughs> so, okay. Okay, but let me just give you another perspective of just how small this number is. This precision requires you to think of macroscopic LIGO mirrors as quantum mechanical objects. And let me show you why. Suppose you want to monitor a LIGO mirror with some precision of delta x, which we now know to be about 10 to the minus 18 meters or so, over some time, okay, you don't do it instantly, you want to uh, monitor it over some time. Let's call this time tau. Now, because you're measuring the position with some precision, by Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you're inevitably perturbing the momentum. So the perturbation of momentum is h bar over delta x. That's a typical number. You learn in second, third year yeah, quantum mechanics. Now, because of this perturbation of momentum, after this time tau, this uncertainty in momentum will translate into the uncertainty in velocity. Right? So your total measurement area will consist of two components that you add in quadrature. One component is your initial precision, delta x squared. Okay? 
The second component is how much your wave packet spreads because of your initial measurement. So tau times the uncertainty in velocity delta p over m squared. Okay, so this you add these two numbers on quadrature. Now look at this. The first term on the left hand side has delta x squared. The second term will have delta x squared in denominator. So you can optimize. You can say you can choose delta x which will optimize this expression and this will give you the minimum precision which is just square root of twice h bar tau divided by m. This is how well you can monitor a free mass and that's called the standard quantum limit. Okay, let's put in the numbers. LIGO mirrors are 40 kilograms you want to monitor, you want to measure frequencies of 10 hertz or higher, so you want to have tau for the 0.1 seconds. Delta x quantum is 10 to the minus 18. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to operate these instruments at a quantum limit. How do we do this? We build an interferometer, and this interferometer looks like this. This is just a schematic uh, outline. You have a laser light, so let me just see if this does it show. Yeah. You have the laser which goes into the beam splitter um, um, through the recycling mirror. I'll talk about this recycling mirror in a second. But the beam splitter sends the light in two directions, in two arms, and then this light accumulates in each of those arms, this one and this one and there's two very high quality fabri pirot resonators. When gravitational wave comes by, it changes, if it has the right polarization, it changes the length of these resonators and counterface. So when one gets longer, the other one gets shorter. When this happens, the phases of light which come back to the beam splitter, they are mismatched. So some of the light then leaks into this direction towards this photo detector. And that's how you see presence of gravitational waves. Now the key to this is that you have to have lots and lots of light in your interferometer. So a very simple but kind of a genius idea from Drivers was to put this recycling mirror. So that some of the light which wants to go leak back to the lasers gets turned around. Actually, 999 thousandths of that light gets turned around and gets sent back into the interferometer, thus increasing the power inside the cavities. The target power which should be circulating in the arms of advanced LIGO is a megawatt. So this laser power which, uh, so we, we are not there yet, so this is, you can still, there's still some way to go, but it will be a megawatt when advanced LIGO is operating and it's design sensitivity. So this laser is, of course, nowhere near megawatt. You know, it's a stationary laser. It's one watt laser or so. Um, now this, uh, of course, interferometer is very noisy. So there are several sources of noise that people have to consider. And of course, the details. Noise is uh, the most important thing about this machine. So let me just walk you through several of the sources. First, these mirrors have to be suspended seismically to isolate them from seismic vibrations of the ground. So I'll show you in a second what the penduli look like, what the suspension systems look like. Then this residual gas clouds which intersect the laser beam create the fluctuations in the optical length inside each of the beams. So you have to have the system in almost complete vacuum. This is one of the best vacui that we have created on Earth. Then the uh, photons, you know, light has quantum nature. So that means when we measure the phase of light, we are limited by the number of photons in our beam. And this is called the shot noise. So this comes from the quantum nature of light. Quantum nature of light comes into the story in another way. Because of quantum nature of light, the number of photons inside each cavity fluctuates. And this causes the fluctuation in radiation pressure which is exerted on each uh, mirrors. So there is radiation pressure noise. These are just some of the noise sources that we have to contend with. And I have to tell you, because I'm a theoretical physicist, so I have to tell you that uh, many of those calculations, many of those noise sources require 
very high level theoretical physics calculations. Most of them were done in Kip Thorne's uh, group at Caltech. This is what the suspensions of advanced LIGO look like. Just to give you an idea, it has to have very, very high quality. Each of these elements has to have as little mechanical loss as possible. So this final 40 kilogram mirror is suspended on the uh, few silica threads which are attached like so. Okay, so this is the attachments. There is very special glue, very low loss glue, which is used to affect each of these attachments. And there is uh, the upper stage, um, which, is, uh, which is also a mirror. And this is um, where all of the control you know, to reduce uh, um, all, all of the actuators which exert control of the mirror are applied to this upper stage. OK, now. This is what the theoretically the target noise for this interferometer should look like. Um, so you have um, uh, just uh, on the x-axis axis you have frequency, okay? On the y-axis you have um, square root of the noise, displacement noise, uh, expressed in dimensionless so divided by the in dimensionless quantity divided by the length of the interferometer. Let me just walk you through some of these noise sources. So this on the upper side is a short noise, quantum nature of light, you count photons. The radiation pressure noise is on this side. Um, they meet at the quantum limit, okay, when they equal to each other, that's the quantum limit. We have the thermal noise, uh, which is a subject I did some research on. And the thermal noise is just basically due to the fluctuation, thermal thermally fluctuating mirror surfaces which displays back and forth. And you have the seismic wall here uh, at below 10 hertz. So this is just some of the noise sources that uh, we have to deal with. And I think I'm, uh, now that I've described to you GR and how the interferometers work, I now want you, uh, I'm handing you over to Eric for the most exciting part of this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. So uh, we have an excellent uh, idea from this slide about what we wanted the advanced LIGO noise curves to look like, what we want our data to look like. And now I will show you what they look like on September 14th, 2015, which is a, a day that is important to me and Yuri and our LIGO collaborators in the room. So we're looking at a few plots here. And um, there are two LIGO detectors like uh, Yuri showed us. There's the LIGO Hanford Observatory, which is the top row, and the LIGO Livingston Observatory, which is the bottom row. On the left-hand side are two strain spectra, just like the ones that Yuri showed us. And it's probably a little bit difficult to read the axes, but once again, this is strain per root hertz here, and this is frequency, same thing here. And this line is 10 to the minus 23. The black curve is showing what the detector could, in theory, achieve based on how much laser we're, power we're putting into it and if we understood our noise sources perfectly. And the red data is showing what we did achieve on this day on average, with a little bit of shading to give you some idea of the statistical fluctuation. So we are indeed on this day on September 14th, which was LIGO's engineering run 8. We haven't officially started taking data yet. We were very close to meeting our uh, specs for um, the beginning of the observing run, which was to be called 01. This was at Hanford. At Livingston, we were doing comparably well, uh, still working very hard on this region um, at low frequencies where we're dominated by seismic noise, but that's for a future talk. Meanwhile, on the right-hand side, these are two time trends. And the uh, x-axis is showing you the time, uh, UTC time that day. And the y-axis is showing you the average in-spiral range in units of megaparsecs. And in case it's difficult to read, uh, this is 60 megaparsecs, and this is 80 megaparsecs up here. This is the distance out to which LIGO could, on average, detect a binary neutron star coalescence given these noise curves. So even though we were just in our commissioning phase and we weren't 
uh, officially taking our uh, uh, observing uh, run one data yet, we were already significantly, we were breaking new ground. Back during initial LIGO, we typically would see these, I mean, these, these charts weren't even scaled this way. We were running at around 15 megaparsecs, um, and occasionally it would go up to maybe 17 or 18 megaparsecs. And this is a huge improvement. This, this looks like maybe a factor of, of three or, or five, but it's more than that because this is the distance at which you see sources. Um, and you have to cube that in order to get the space-time volume of sources that, that you see. So even in this early phase, we knew that we were seeing so much more of the universe, we could, in principle, see something. You'll notice that the inspo range drops to zero periodically. That's because the detectors fall in and out of lock. And in order to maintain them in this very low noise state, we use servos or active feedback loops and keep the mirrors in exactly the right position so that we can maintain this low noise state. And if a, a truck drives by or there's a uh, earthquake in Japan or something like this, it can sometimes break our lock and we'll, we'll lose it for a little while and our commissioners who are on site or our operators will work very hard to restore lock. You'll notice that there is a vertical black arrow on this plot and it happened that something very exciting happened at this time. This was about 9.50 UTC on September 14th, and uh, there are two things that I'll point out on the, these two plots before we move on. First of all, you'll notice at Livingston that this fortuitous uh, event happened in this nice little stretch of lock, before which uh, we were down, and uh, after which we were down, and we had uh, about an hour and a half, two hours, uh, where we uh, were lucky to get the signal, which is nice. The other thing I want to point out, because it will become relevant later, is you'll notice that the Hanford detector is not tremendously, but is noticeably more sensitive during this time. So as we look at our data later showing what we saw at this exciting time on the 14th of September, you'll see it a little bit more clearly in the Hanford detector. So let's move now to a timeline of the events on that day as they unfolded in my in email inbox and the email inboxes of everyone in the LIGO Science Collaboration, which includes uh, over uh, a thousand people when we include our, our collaborators in Virgo. So at 7.50 um, p.m., uh, th sorry, so this, this was the exact time, 7.50 p.m. Um, ah, yeah, this is, this is local time, uh, p.m. in Australia, we're in Melbourne now. Um, gravitational waves sweep through the detectors and cause our test masses to oscillate. About three minutes later, an automated computer program picked this up and sent alerts out and logged this in our list of candidate events. This, the search that gets the credit for seeing it first was called coherent wave burst. A postdoc working at the Albert Einstein Institute in Germany, who is described in the media coverage subsequently as soft-spoken, Marco Drago was sitting at his computer and saw this event. He was working at, at a convenient uh, work time, uh, whereas the U people in the US were mostly asleep. And uh, he immediately knew this was a big deal, and this was very important. So he showed it to a colleague, Andy Lundgren. They called the sites. They made sure that everyone was aware of it at the sites. It, no tests had been run that they were aware of at the site, so they sent an email to the entire LIGO science collaboration. And the subject of the email was very interesting event. <laughs> this naturally got many people's uh, attention. Um, I was awake at this time, as was Paul Lasky, who will figure in the, in the next slide as well. And we, everyone who was awake uh, and got this email immediately began looking at the plots in it. Um, one of my jobs in the LIGO collaboration, it's, it's kind of a service job, but one that's important for, for this sort of thing, is helping to vet detections. And the way that we vet detections is we shake the mirrors in the detector as if a gravitational wave were passing through them. And we do this in order to vet our ability to make detections. And that thinking is that if we can inject these fake signals, like a binary black hole would, and detect them, then it will give us confidence that when the real thing happens, we'll know what we're doing. It was also supposed to be a way of keeping a lid on this because if we had had a little bit more time in our engineering run before Mother Nature gave us this, we would have had it set up so that it could be done blindly, and no one would know until a box opening event whether it was real or not. But we were still putting the finishing touches on the blind injection system, uh, and this happened. So I had to send out the very second email on the thread, the discovery thread, was sent from a Monash researcher 
I said both injections are over three hours away. So at this point, whatever doubt there was among people who were up and reading this all around the world that this could be a test was essentially removed at this point. Emails began pouring in. Sergei Klamenko, who authored this pipeline, began looking at the data and said, as early as this, that it looked like a 27 solar mass chirp mass event. That's this is some number that characterizes the total mass of the event. I guess we need to do the detection checklist. <laughs> so a couple hours have passed now. I'm on Skype looking, who can I talk to? <laughs> Dr. Lasky happens to be away. <laughs> So you can see that I was initially very conservative, as we are trained to be. And I said, Paul says, how excited should I be? I said, pretty excited. I wouldn't bet money on it at this point, but it's the most convincing early outlier I've ever seen. I didn't have in LIGO. You see, I've edited it. And then I had to add in LIGO. You know, this is the most promising thing. But 12 minutes later, we were cracking open the liquor. And <laughs> we, we, were, we were increasingly convinced the more emails flew in. And so why were we so excited? Um, here's why. Many of you will have seen this by now. This is one of the plots in the Physical Review letter that announced this discovery. And there were things like this available that night already that were generated by these automa automated uh, searches. Um, on the top is a strain time series. And the left-hand side is showing the strain that was measured in the uh, Hanford-Washington detector. On the right-hand side is showing uh, Livingston. Um, but they've I shifted them in time so that the Livingston, which would have um, been hit slightly before or after Hanford, is, is on top of it. And also there's a sign flip to account for the relative orientation of the detectors. And you can see that they, they line up perfectly. And not only do they line up perfectly, but you can see this uh, oscillatory pattern. And this is the, uh, the two um, black holes getting closer and closer, and they're merging around here and then ringing down. And if you've looked at simulated signals before, this looks like a really loud injected signal. This isn't, this isn't what anyone was expecting our first signal to look like. It's a uh, smack you over the back of the head loud signal that is um, it, it, it's undeniable in the data. And, and this is part of why things moved so quickly these, these first few nights. And uh, that might only be apparent if you are a, a longtime LIGO member. But if you now then look at the second row, you can see why we all thought this. The second row is showing this, uh, you can compare this top row, which is the actual data, to the predictions of uh, numerical relativity, uh, which are the, in red and blue. And you can see that just looking at the red here, the red here, and the blue here, and the blue here, that this looks ex you know, very convincingly like a binary black hole. But what's also very impressive, if you look at the gray colors, these are two different types of reconstructions for what our, uh, our computer uh, algorithms uh, fit this data to. One is showing the, um, the, the darker gray is the reconstructed template. This is a bank of templates that are built on numerical relativity and analytic uh, relativity. So these are designed to look exactly like a binary black hole event. And they're so in such a good agreement, you may not even be able to distinguish the dark black line from the red. It's essentially completely on top of it. If that's not convincing enough, you can even use an algorithm, this light gray one, which is a wavelet reconstruction. It doesn't assume anything about general relativity. It just tries to reconstruct the signal using a, a, a wavelet decomposition and sees what it comes up with. Not, no GR built into it. And it gives you a very similar looking profile, just with bigger error bars. This is made even more dramatic. You can then subtract. You, you, you have the, the data with the signal in it, and plus noise. You know what you think the signal is. You subtract it, and you can look at the residuals. And that's this data down here. And it's in, it, this is exactly what well-behaved Gaussian noise looks like. So it passes all of these sanity checks that were performed in the hours, days, weeks, and months following the event. Finally, these are a pair of spectrograms. This is time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. And this chirping sound, which we will hear. I won't subject you to another uh, version that I, I perform on my own, is a, exactly, exactly what we expect. Here, the binary black holes are further apart. They're moving faster and faster, and they're merging around here. And the ring down is very weak, and we, we don't see the ring down signal in the spectrograms. But this is, this is stuff you can see by eye. 
Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe during Q&A. <laughs> um, so what does this data mean astrophysically? What are we, you know, I, this is hopefully convinced you we, something's there, but what are we, what are we looking at? So uh, there are as tremendous physics in these waveforms and in this data, and it's really hard to even wrap your, your mind around it sometimes, even if you study this. So there are three phases of this event. And because we lucked out and got these very massive black holes, 30-something uh, solar masses each, we think, and this is much heavier than we expected our first binary coalescence uh, objects to be, we were able to see all of this. Um, if they had been lighter objects, this would have been pushed into higher frequency uh, noise, and we would have missed it. The first part of this signal is called the in-spiral. This is where you have two clearly separated compact objects, two clearly separated black holes. And you can use relatively, comparatively, simple uh, calculations in order to estimate the waveform in this regime. Uh, then as you get closer to this uh, uh, change in shape here, you enter the merger phase. And this is where the uh, numerical relativity becomes extremely important for describing how these two black holes merge and form a single black hole. And finally, there's this very much smaller ring down signal at the end, which uh, is where, as Yuri put it, the black hole sheds its hair, and the no hair theorem says it can't have any, it can't have any hair. It has to be a, a Kerr solution. So whatever hair it has on it, it sheds it off and wriggles down into its Kerr solution, and that's happening in this little ring down phase. To attach some numbers to this that I still find amazing, that we can look at this bottom plot. And this is showing the relative separation between the black holes in terms of the short shield radius, I believe, of the final black hole. And uh, on the same time, showing the, rel the, the velocity of the black holes. The time is on the x-axis. And you can see that if we look at the relative black hole velocity, the this, this system enters the band. These black holes are already moving 30-something percent the speed of light. And they only go faster. And by the time they, they merge it, it stops to make sense talking about there being separate black holes that are going over 60% the speed of light. At the same time, we see them approaching uh, almost a single short shield radius separation. And then the dis description of separation breaks down. Now, uh, for Daniel's benefit, we'll listen to the um, audio of what you actually hear in the detectors had you been in the control room that night and had everything band passed exactly right so that you would de-emphasize the low frequencies, the high frequencies, and hear just the right thing. What you're going to hear is the two sets of sounds. The first set of sounds will be the actual data as it would have been heard, but appropriately whitened so that you can actually get a signal. And the uh, gravitational wave signal is going to sound like a low whomp. Then you're going to hear a second uh, version, which is sped up, and it's going to sound like a chirp. And the second one's much easier to hear. The first one kind of sounds like a door closing or something like that. The second one sounds like an actual chirping sound, and it will repeat. Each one will repeat twice, and then the whole thing will repeat. While you're watching it, you'll see a spectrogram and a time series showing the, the data evolving in time and showing the, spec, the chirp happening in the spectrogram. <laughs> So you could you hear it okay out in the yeah. So the, the low the low one I find you need like a like a subwoofer or something to hear. It's it's very very deep and guttural. Um, but anyway, that's what that's that's the audio visual representation. So. How significant was this? We've, we've looked at the plots. You can see it by eye. Can we attach some statistics to it? Here are another pair of uh, plots from the detection paper that I'll try to explain for you now. We have a tremendous amount of healthy redundancy in LIGO scientific collaboration, where we try to look for gravitational wave sources using multiple pipelines, multiple techniques, try to find things in different ways, with the idea being that this is some healthy competition benefits us. And also, if something is a little bit surprising or unexpected, we have a big safety net so that we know that we can find everything that the universe has given us. So the right-hand side of this plot represents a search that is highly tuned. It's the uh, Lamborghini of searches or something like this, which is really a lot of relativity has gone into it. And it's 
making as many assumptions as possible to get the most significance out of the search. The left-hand search is a sports utility vehicle or something. It's very practical. It is powerful, but it's designed to be able to be much more flexible. It can find things that instead of chirping up, they chirp down, or they don't chirp at all. They just stay at a single frequency. It's a burst search. This one's a matched filtering search for just compact binaries. We'll start with the right-hand one. And the left-hand side here is showing the number of events that were found with the significance of this detection statistic, which is the right-hand axis in some number of trials. And the way that we conduct trials, these are pseudo-experiments. We take our data from the two detectors, we have Hanford on top, Livingston on the bottom, and we shift it by an amount greater than the travel time of gravitational waves between the detectors. And then we shift it again. Every time we shift it, we run the analysis again and see what kind of triggers we find, what kind of candidate events. Every time we shift it, it gives us a realization of a different kind of realization of noise for an entire network of detectors. And in this way, we can estimate our background very robustly. This is the uh, results we get from our uh, search using 16 uh, days of data from the beginning of our first observing run, plus a little bit of the engineering runs, plus this one over here, which is the detection. So you can see that here's noise. It's all clustered over here, and then there's this massive outlier. It's unlike anything else we saw. If you then look at the time slide results, this is estimating our background. The blue line is the one to focus on. This is what you get from trying to estimate your background. So in order to see when do you get something that has a detection statistic value of 22, you'd have to follow this line down here. Somewhere around down here, we didn't, we didn't do this many trials because it would have taken more computing power than we had. But already up in here, we're in the more than five sigma regime. So one of the questions we sometimes had in the, in the press discussions was, uh, why isn't it suspicious that you detected something at just five sigma? It's, it's much, much more than five sigma. We just stopped throwing computers at it after five sigma. <laughs> These this dark curves show triggers we get when we leave the event in our data. Because imagine if you have a, an actual signal in your data and you time shift the, the two series with respect to each other, you'll see things that look kind of like triggers because one of, there is a trigger in one of the data streams and those just clean up magnificently when you remove that single trigger from the data. I won't go through everything in gory detail for the burst search, but I'll just say that you see the same signal detected with a very high significance. It's about four and a half sigma. Uh, with the burst search. So not nearly as significant, but very dramatic signal, even if you don't uh, put any assumptions in about general relativity. And at this point, I thought we could go through some numbers. And I have a fact sheet, which I'm going to pass out. There aren't enough for everyone. But I thought maybe we could circulate some of these around. And you can, can I ask you to just pass these back? And we'll do another one on this side. And we'll go through these together on the uh, screen as well. All right, so how far, let's, let's start off. We'll, we'll, we won't go through all of these, but we'll kind of pick and choose what's most interesting. So how far away was this thing? It was, we think about 400 megaparsecs, which corresponds to 1.3 billion light years. And one of the fun things about this mean, is that if you think about the, the distances involved, this means that this binary black hole coalesced uh, about mm, 600 billion, sorry, million years before there was multi-celled life on Earth. When I mentioned this to Yuri, um, as we were getting ready for the talk, he said, and man was in the ice age hunting Neanderthal when, it entered our, when the signal entered our galaxy. And I thought for a minute to check, and yes, that's also true. <laughs> so while it was propagating through our galaxy, we had the uh, ice age, the civilization formed, etc. Um, uh, we talked about the significance of the event. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, the masses. So Yuri mentioned that we've, we've most black hole evidence for black holes we have is uh, black holes of 10 uh, solar masses or so. What's very dramatic about this, this signal that we've observed is that the masses of these black holes are, are very big. So one of them was estimated to have a, a mass of uh, 37 solar masses or thereabouts, the other one of about 30 which would have left a remnant black hole with a, a mass of about 60 solar masses. What 
One of the things that is an interesting problem in um, gravitational wave astronomy is trying to understand how black holes spin. And black hole spin is a, a dimensionless parameter that can be between zero and just less than one. Uh, if you had something uh, with a spin close to one, that would mean that it was uh, spinning at close to the maximal amount allowed by uh, general relativity. We attempted to use the data that we, we have in order to measure the spin of the constituent black holes to see if they were spinning very quickly. But we couldn't detect any non-zero spin. We just have these very weak constraints. However, we know from the fact that this remnant black hole formed from the coalescence that it does, in fact, have quite a large spin. So we know at least one black hole spin now out in the universe, which is, is quite large. Um, where was the signal detected? It was detected in the southern hemisphere, and it was localized to an area in the sky of about 600 square degrees. Um, if you're an astronomer, um, this will be a shockingly large number to you. If you're not, this might <coughs> sound meaningless. Um, so here's a sky map to put this in perspective. That banana shape is the uh, localization we have on the sky for this uh, binary black hole coalescence. The way that the shape is determined is primarily by timing. So we look at when the gravitational wave spikes the two detectors. And that restricts, by, by measuring that, we, that restricts us to a sort of a ring around the sky where the gravitational wave could have come from. Then we use the amplitude of the signal in each gravitational wave detector to eliminate some of the degeneracy, but we can't eliminate all of it. So this a big ring is uh, um, eliminated into a banana and maybe a little piece of a banana that was cut off. But it's a 600 square degree uh, region, which makes it very hard to look for with follow-up of electromagnetic telescopes. The signal lasted for two tenths of a second. And it had a peak gravitational wave strain of 10 to the minus 21. It displaced the interferometer arms, uh, the mirrors and the arms at most two thousandths of a femtometer. The black holes, as I mentioned, were moving at 60% the speed of light. How much energy was emitted in gravitational waves during this 0.2 seconds? This is probably my favorite number after maybe 60% the speed of light. The answer in my favorite units is three solar masses. So this is like uh, our own sun met an anti-sun, and all of that energy was, I mean, all the mass energy in the sun was completely radiated away all at once, and that still is not quite getting us up to the energy that we, our best guess for how much energy was emitted in gravitational waves, all in two tenths of a second. The ring down frequency in which the, the black hole, uh, this is when the black hole loses its hair. This uh, took place over four milliseconds, and the frequency was at 250 hertz. We did a bunch of tests to see if the uh, black, binary black hole signal was completely consistent with general relativity. We have an entire paper on testing GR with this event, but I'll ruin the paper for you and say it's consistent. We did arrive at a mass of the graviton, uh, a bound on the mass of the graviton, but I, I believe it's not competitive with other, other um, measurements. And we've now constrained the rate of binary black holes, which was previously not known. It's an n equals 1 constraint, so it has very big error bars. But, but this is now about two orders of magnitude, and it previously was many more. It was about four or five based on, and it was based on theory, not observation. So this, funny enough, actually represents a dramatic shrinking in the parameter space of the allowed coalescence rate of binary black holes. And there are serious astrophysical consequences for it in terms of models and other predictions. What are the units? These are inverse cubic gigaparsecs per year. So one question, uh, which is an interesting one, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly answer before we start to wind things up. Yuri mentioned that the masses of these um, black holes are surprisingly large. One question could be, where did they come from? And there are a couple of candidate explanations. One is that they evolved according to the field model, which posits that the stars began life together in a binary, or sorry, two stars began life together in a binary, they expended their nuclear fuel, they became uh, black holes. These would have been very low metallicity stars to be able to form black holes this big. Then this binary evolved together, uh, the uh, slowly radiating away uh, 
angular momentum and gravitational waves since what finally coalesced uh, 1.3 billion years ago. Another model is the dynamic formation model. And this posits that the black holes um, did, weren't longtime friends. They met each other in a casual hookup in a globular <laughs> cluster. And they happened to be moving slow enough in a, and in a region that was densely populated enough with black holes that they had a chance of meeting. And they quickly uh, met, uh, became bound. They had time to circularize. And then they, um, they emitted gravitational waves after meeting relatively recently. At the moment, we don't know which, if, if any of either of these models are true for the, um, the explanation of this event. This, there wasn't enough information uh, in our signal to, to disentangle between these two possibilities. And it's, of course, possible that there's some other explanation. So, um, so brief uh, bragging. Um, we did it. This is what Dave Wrightsey, the director of the LIGO Laboratory, said in the US announcement. Uh, it was a great way to usher in the era of gravitational wave astronomy. Since then, the LIGO collaboration has been monitoring the press of the, of, that surrounded the event and some of the um, metrics of, of this. And one of the things that we were very pleased with is that the, in the first day in which the detection paper was available, the downloads exceeded all PRL, um, all physical review downloads from 2015 across all their journals and all of their articles. <laughs> At the peak uh, rate, it reached uh, 10,000 downloads of the paper per minute. Um, you probably already all know this, that the discovery was covered everywhere. Monash actually made an appearance in the New York Times. Um, Paul Lasky, Daniel Price, Letizia Salmon, I believe. Uh, I don't know if Paul was actually in the video swilling beer, but um, <laughs> there was a big party we had um, uh, at Monash, and this was one of the, the New York Times videos. Obama tweeted it. We uh, Monash scientists were mentioned in the Sydney Morning Herald, which was syndicated by Fairfax across Australia. Um, and that's a good segue into our Monash contributions. Um, so uh, Michael had asked that Yuri um, comment on his work, but he doesn't. Uh, so I'll say that Yuri was instrumental in developing a theoretical framework for understanding the detector noise, and especially thermal noise, in advanced LIGO. And without his contributions to sort of design philosophy and understanding how to control noise I don't think that we would have had the detector that we ended up having in the end that allowed us to do this. I already mentioned that I was involved in the vetting of our detections and creating the system for injecting signals. Um, Letizia Samet and I uh, were involved in one of the 13, I believe, follow-up papers that was issued, pub submitted for publication simultaneously with the detection paper. And because we detected these two black holes that were very massive and uh, coalesced at a high rate, we wrote a paper along with our colleagues showing that this means that the stochastic background from many, many black holes like these that are too far away for us to detect and individually is probably detectable by advanced LIGO. Paul Lasky, also in the audience today, and you featured on our Skype uh, chat earlier, is in the process of putting the final touches on a paper about how we can use the the uh, GW150914, what we learned from that to test sort of the nonlinear aspects of general relativity. Shi Chu, I don't know if she is in the audience or if he's even back from his trip yet, probably not. Um, but he uh, was doing a third year research project with me when this story hit. Lucky, lucky guy. And so he's doing a paper, um, the title is this here, and the Tizia is also a collaborator on that. And Chris Whittle, is Chris around? Yeah, oh, shucks. Um, Chris is uh, doing an honors project with me in Lincoln, and Russ, I can now tell you that the reason that we poached Chris is because we detected gravitational waves, and so <laughs> that was our excuse. Um, anyway, here's our team. Wait, um, wait, wait, Dun Duncan. Oh, oh, thank you, Yuri. Um, yeah, I had him up in the corner. Um, uh, thank you. Um, Duncan Galloway and Avit uh, Roll um, are also uh, working to detect electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational waves. And um, this will involve this telescope called GOTO. There are other collaborators besides Duncan Avon, who um, I'm not mentioning. But this is one of our big projects at Monash uh, in uh, Alliance of Work. 
And this is uh, something that's going to be increasingly exciting in the coming years as these detections become more regular, looking to see if they, there's a flash of light that is coincident. Um, thank you, Yuri, for catching that. Here is a, a photo of our team before the official announcement, but while we, we were smugly looking <laughs> <laughs> for the camera that we know something you don't. Uh, the future, what does the future hold? Um, so if you just think about, uh, think back to your um, statistics class and think about Poisson statistics, you can convince yourself that if you see one thing, any, you'd have one thing in 16 days of data, and then you take data for a lot more than 16 days, you want to see more of whatever that thing is. And it turns out that it doesn't even matter that it's a gravitational wave event. This argument holds for any situation like this. So based on that kind of, a, that kind of argument, one can imagine that there are, it's, it's highly probable that there will be other detections in the rest of the LIGO's first observing run. It's more likely than not that when we issue those results, they should, there should be interesting things to report. Of course, as the detector improves over the coming years, we're only a, th a third of the way toward design sensitivity. If when we reach design sensitivity, this will mean we should increase our detection rate by a factor of almost 30. Because remember, you take the distance as one over proportional to one over strain, and you get volume by cubing the distance. So this gives you this big increase. This means that we, should, we could be detecting gravitational wave events at a rate of about one per day. And there are many other sources that are possible. Binary black holes are one of the most exciting. We may also see binary neutron stars. We could see a stochastic background. We could see gravitational waves from isolated neutron stars. I mentioned there are 12 companion papers, which I uh, um, encourage everyone to read, uh, from testing GR astrophysical implications and uh, uh, looking for um, a stochastic background, etc. I'll mention that um, there is a preprint from the Fermi collaboration. This is a satellite looking for gamma rays, which it uh, is claiming to have seen a coincident gamma ray burst with a pair of black holes, which would be a surprise. And we're um, a little bit over, but we have three slides left and a movie. And I'll pass the microphone over to Yuri now to wrap things up and put this in a historical context. So thank you for your continuing patience. Uh, Eric and I thought it was appropriate after looking into the future of this field to also look a little bit in the past. And the past is very interesting. The whole concept of LIGO came out of an unpublished paper by one of the founders, Raymond, Rainer Weiss. So this is an amazing paper. You know, so this is uh, just one of the um, things, uh, one of the drawings out of that paper, where basically the whole LIGO design is outlined in great detail, you know, with interferometry, with using lasers, with using local oscillators for readouts, and with extremely detailed analysis of the noise sources. So this is the list of the noise sources from that paper. I won't go through all of them, but let me just say, these are exactly the noise sources that we are still fighting with today, except for maybe the thermal gradient noise is not very important, and the cosmic ray noise turned out to be unimportant. But everything else is basically the list of menu that the modern LIGO experimentalist is battling with today. Now, Ray Weiss did not believe in publishing. <laughs> he wasn't going to publish anything until he detected gravitational waves because he believed that everything should be you know, completed before publishing. So this is very contrary to modern philosophy in science. <laughs> but this is the guy who will probably get a Nobel Prize if it was you know, up, to, um, up to me. <laughs> it was published in a quarterly journal, progress journal at MIT. I mean, now, of course, it's on the web. It's publicly available. But before, it was, you know, it was just an in-house document for himself and for other people working on LIGO. It's an amazing paper. You should read it, like the level of concentration, level of detail. So this is my guess for other two people who will get Nobel Prize um, if this all, of course, holds up. I'm speaking cheekily. These are the founders, the three founders for uh, the LIGO program. Ray Weiss was one of them. Kip Thorne was uh, uh, basically the inspiration, the theorist who 
had the vision that uh, this was important, this was doable. He convinced many, many people to go through with this, including the people who did the experiment. And then the, the third guy is Ronald Reaver, uh, extremely gifted and charismatic experimentalist. I knew him. He is, uh, Gla he is from Glasgow. He was a full professor at Caltech. Very difficult personality. So he, he made some of the key experimental inventions, including recycling mirror, including the readouts um, that I used. There's a pound river uh, filters that uh, people who work in optics know about. Uh, unfortunately, he was kind of later on, there was a period in LIGO history called Reaver Wars, and uh, he was divorced from the mainstream of the project, but he's still considered to be the founder. Uh, uh, currently, he is unfortunately unable to participate in all the festivities because he is suffering from dementia. He's back in Scotland in one of the care houses. So, um, I thought we would end with a brief movie. I'm sorry to keep you a bit longer, but it's a very interesting movie uh, made by Caltech, and I think it puts a very nice historical perspective. I came to Caltech in 1966 on the faculty working in relativity. I began thinking in great detail about the future of gravitational wave physics and astronomy. Ray Weiss had been the primary inventor of the laser interferometer gravity wave detector. And his classic paper written in the early 1970s just lays it out and says, here's what you have to deal with, here's how you deal with it. The important thing to do in this field was to do experiments to test the theory. Those are hard experiments because it turns out gravity relative to all the other forces we know about is a pipsqueak, it's a nothing. Between 1980 and 1983, NSF funded Caltech to build a 40 meter prototype. And NSF funded MIT to do a feasibility study. So each of these efforts then running in parallel became crucial inputs. In 1989, we made the proposal to build LIGO. That was a Caltech-MIT joint proposal. And in 1992, NSF, after very careful review, said, okay, we're going to go forward with this. We're gonna fund the project. And this was a bold thing. I mean, NSF took a bold step. NSF bought in because they had faith in Barry Barish, the most brilliant director of large projects that physics has ever seen. He immediately saw that, that some of the things that needed to happen should be happening quickly, like you need to build buildings, you need to build the observatories. And it took years. Hanford got started first, then Livingston. And then, of course, once the facility is constructed, then you have to start putting in the detectors. In 1999, there was a dedication ceremony. The interferometers were working. They weren't working at anywhere near their design sensitivity. There was a lot of work that needed to be done before we were ready to go into the first observing run. Nobody had ever made something like this before, so there was a lot of technological challenges that needed to be overcome. Barry Barish realized that if you're building these big interferometers, you better have a community. The LIGO scientific collaboration is about 1,000 people. We all want to detect gravitational waves. We all want to start doing gravitational wave astronomy. We don't have two collaborations seeing who detects it first, we, who detects it better. We work together. We ran our initial detectors from 2002 to 2010. We saw nothing. Now, you say, well, that's a terrible defeat. That's not true. The LIGO scientific collaboration was in existence, and they were deeply involved with the data analysis and tracked down everything that we didn't understand about that detector and found out what it was. We had already proposed that in the 1989 proposal, that we were going to do a two-stage thing. We would build the initial detector, and then we would build a follow-on detector with the experience we'd gotten from the initial detector called Vance LIGO. We rebuilt our detectors. We've been redesigning them for about 12 years. So we have more light, better suspensions, and better isolation from the ground, and it's that combination that allowed LIGO to become 10 times more sensitive It was Monday morning, September 14th. I knew that there was something going on because I subscribed to the logs. This particular log pointed to something that looked like it might actually be 
a gravitational wave. What I saw is what is called a time frequency plot, called a chirp, and it was strong. It was unbelievably stronger than anything I expected to be a first detection. It was so strong you could see it by eye, and here was the chirp at Hanford, Washington, and there was the chirp at De Livingston, Louisiana, and I thought, my God, this, this looks like it's it. It was just perfect. In fact, it was almost too good to be true. When I looked at it, I said, well, somebody must have done something wrong and injected a signal. Nobody right away believed it. Everybody thought it was a fluke. It was too good. And it took us a while to get to the point where all of us believe it. It's monumental. <laughs> it's like Galileo using the telescope for the first time. When our descendants look back and they ask, what is the legacy of that era for humanity? I think it will be rather similar to us looking back on the era of the Renaissance when we say, well, the legacy was great art, great music. And so I think the LIGO and gravitational waves, along with the electromagnetic study of the universe, will be a huge part of our legacy for future generations.